Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you all today is one that absolutely will make you upset. As I say in so many cases like this one, it's a case that should have never happened the way that it did and it's just very scary to think that people like this monster are just out and walking around. With that being said, let's just jump right into the case today. Today, we are going to be discussing the murder of Muje Dumboya. Muje was only 16 years old when her life was taken from her. She was a 16-year-old sophomore at Campwood High School in Grand Rapids, Michigan. She was described as energetic, full of life. She had a bigger-than-life personality with an adventurous spirit. She loved looking pretty, always borrowing her aunt's makeup to look her best. She especially loved shoes and fashion. She was also very organized, always offering to even clean her aunt's home because she really just enjoyed the process of cleaning and organizing. She loved dancing and music and taking dance classes. She also took classes for martial arts and archery, so she was just overall a very active young woman with a lot of interests. She was also described as being a sweet girl who loved making those around her feel comfortable and loved. She complimented those around her frequently and those who had a chance to know her all loved her. When she was little, she originally wanted to be a nurse to help people when she grew up, but then she changed her ambitions and she decided that she wanted to be a police officer. She wanted to grow up and help fight injustices and racism when she graduated high school. In 2005, Muje and her mother, as well as her three sisters, they all moved to the United States from her home country of Sierra Leone as refugees to flee the country that had just gotten through a civil war. The war had been done in 2002, but the country was still suffering the extreme consequences of this civil war. It wasn't a safe place to live anymore, so that's why Muje's family and so many other other families like hers left the country for a better, safer place to live. When Muje was only three years old, they ended up in a refugee camp. There, they wore used clothes and were given food rations by the United Nations, but soon after, the UN relocated them to Michigan. Muje's family described that they were happy to get away from their home country and make a new life in the U.S. They saw it as a second chance at life. They went from walking miles and miles and fighting for their survival every day to living a more comfortable life free of fear. Once in the U.S., the family was described as a strong, close-knit family full of strong, independent women. Muje's father stayed back in their home country while the four women moved to the U.S. and lived near Muje's aunt, who she was very close with. Muje's mother would go on to say that if she ever told Muje no, she would go a few towns over to her aunt's house who would always say yes to her. She was like her best friend. Muje enjoyed a nice, quiet life with her family in a safe suburban neighborhood. That was until Muje had experienced some of the worst things that a young girl can go through. Everything started when Muje was only 15 years old. During the summer of 2017, she met 17-year-old Dequarius Bibbs, who went by DQ, on Facebook. He was from Saginaw, which is located about two miles away from where she was living in Grand Rapids. But that summer, Muje had been living with her aunt, Naja, and it just so happened that Dequarius was also living with a family member in a suburb only six miles away from where Muje was living. DQ was also living with his aunt, Tiara Burnett, and his aunt's fiance at the time, a 43-year-old man named Quinn James. Now, Muje and DQ messaged back and forth for about three weeks before they finally went on their first date in the same month in July of 2017. For their first day, Quinn was driving the pair around to their various activities. Basically, it seemed just like an uncle driving around his nephew and his new date around to all of these different activities for the day. At the end of the night, Quinn dropped Muje back off at her home. However, only about 10 minutes after Muje returned home, DQ called her again and asked her to come back outside to Quinn's car. And allegedly, once Muje got back in the car, Quinn took her in the back seat and raped her. According to DQ, he was afraid of Quinn. He said that he had seen him choke his aunt multiple times and any time he tried to intervene, Quinn choked him as well. So, even though Muje was crying and begging Quinn to stop as he raped her in the back seat of his car, 
DQ did nothing to intervene. He didn't stop Quinn. He just held her hand and watched as Mujay cried as she was being assaulted. After that, Quinn allegedly raped Mujay multiple more times over the course of that summer. He did so in at least three different locations. Once was after he took DQ and Mujay out for ice cream, and once was in his home, and I guess another was in the parking lot of a charter school. I don't know all of the details for how she got to these different locations or how the situation played out, but that is what's been reported that, you know, he just kept raping her at all of these different locations, probably when she was just trying to hang out with DQ. During the one at the charter school, DQ allegedly held her hand again and watched as she cried. Now, let's talk a little bit more about who exactly Quinn James is. As you can clearly tell, he is not a good person. He's a shitty, awful person, in fact. But this wasn't anything new. He had a long, long history of similar behavior that just seemed to slip through the cracks like it always seems to happen in these cases. Those who knew James described that he was charming, likable, and friendly. He seemed to have a good relationship with the women in his life. And he actually had two children, I believe, a set of twins that he shared with another woman who he was no longer with, so they were not the children of Tierra. But he did have a criminal record. Back in July of 1989, he had numerous accounts of stealing cars. These times, I believe, were nonviolent at first, but that was until September of 1989 when he allegedly stole a car from a young woman, and in the process, he threatened her with a hammer and attempted to rape her. Then, in 1990, when Quinn was only 15 years old, he stole another car from another young woman. In that case, Quinn hid in the backseat of her car and hit her over the head with a tire iron, and she was able to jump out of the car before he drove off with the car, which he later abandoned, so she was okay, but clearly probably traumatized and probably was injured from being hit over the head with a tire iron. When he was arrested for this, the officers described him as aggressive, defiant, and he showed no remorse. He was impulsive, arrogant, and reactive. They said that he had a very high likelihood of reoffending. They also concluded that he resents adults and authority. So, to these charges, he did eventually plead guilty to the case of armed robbery. I don't know what happened with the attempted rape. I don't think he was ever charged with that. But because of this, he did go to jail when he was only 16 years old. While in jail, he was also charged with two more counts of attempted possession of weapons by a prisoner, so clearly he was not on his best behavior when he was a prisoner. He actually spent 20 years in jail for these charges before he was released on parole in 2011. After being released, he applied for a job as a custodian at the Kentwood Public School System. Even though he was a felon, he was able to get a job with the public school system because he wasn't a sex offender. On his application, he had other community members who were known and respected in the area as his references. Those individuals vouched for him, so because of this, he was hired. Now, a lot of people will have opinions on a felon being hired in a public school, and I definitely see why. But I would say most, if not all, felons have a very rough time finding work after leaving jail. Most people can't find anything. And for those who are honest and learned their lesson and just want to be a productive member of society, not being able to find a job can lead to a vicious cycle of turning back to crime because it's all they know as a way to make money and fight their way to stay or get out of poverty. So personally, I don't have a problem with hiring nonviolent offenders for positions like this at schools where they have minimal interactions with the students, but for violent offenders, keep those crazies out of our schools. We need to see the actual background of how these people got in jail. It shouldn't just say like, oh, they stole a car. Because someone who steals a car or steals from the store or whatever, they might be doing so because they had no other option and they're trying to feed their family or whatever. But some people who hit others over the side of the head with a tire iron and those who attempt to rape somebody... They're not committing these crimes because they need to feed their family and they had no other choice and they are raised wrong and they don't see any other way to, you know, provide for themselves or their families. 
These are people who are just violent and are going to do whatever they want, no matter who they hurt. So, if the school system wasn't able to see the actual violence in his record, I do see how and why Quinn was hired, but I do think that this is something that should change. To those around Quinn after he started working, he genuinely seemed like he wanted a second chance. He was grateful for those who hired him. He was well-liked by other school staff, and nobody really had a problem with him. He seemed to have been reformed at first. But being given a second chance was not enough to keep Quinn James out of trouble. Back in the summer of 2013, there was a 17-year-old girl walking back from high school in Grand Rapids when a black Chevrolet Impala drove up next to her. The man driving was Quinn James, who was in his late 30s at the time. He rolled his windows down and started talking to her. Initially, this young girl just kept walking, but he offered to buy her some new shoes after noticing that the shoes that she was wearing looked a little bit worn. So, this young girl ended up going with him. The two got lunch together, she gave him her number, and from there, they started hanging out. At first, Quinn seemed like a good man to this young girl who has only been identified by the initials BT. She knew that Quinn was older than her, but she didn't realize how much older. She probably thought that he was in his 20s if she was willing to hang out with him. Either way, Quinn would take BT to the nail salon. He would buy her clothes, shoes, and would take her on dates. But one of these times, James brought BT back to his apartment, and here, he wanted to initiate romantic relations. Up to that point, they hadn't as much as kissed or done anything sexual, and of course, Quinn became very frustrated. He was spending all this time with her, putting in the work, and she was not reciprocating, so he felt entitled. He asked her to have sex with him, and she said no, she wanted to leave. She said she didn't want that kind of relationship with him. But as she was leaving, according to her, Quinn stopped her, grabbed her with both hands around her neck, and said, give it to me or I'll take it, as he choked her. She said in that moment, she could feel her face growing hot and her eyes were bulging. So, she complied. She didn't want him to kill her. She was allowing him to rape her because she thought that if she didn't, she was going to die. She told him to stop multiple times, but she didn't physically fight him off because, again, she was scared. He threatened to kill her if she screamed or fought. After the rape, BT didn't know what to do. She didn't have a car, and she didn't know the neighborhood. So, she told Quinn that she wanted to get some food, so the two went to a nearby Applebee's. While there, she went in the bathroom, and while in the bathroom, she was in there for quite a while because she called the police. Because she was in the bathroom for quite a while, Quinn figured out what she was doing pretty quickly, so he fled. By the time police showed up, obviously he wasn't there, and they took BT to the hospital, and they did a rape kit, but after that, nothing happened. The sheriff's department said that there wasn't enough evidence to convict, there wasn't even enough evidence to issue a warrant or anything like that. So because of this, the school that he worked at with young boys and girls, they were not notified. So even though he raped a 17-year-old girl, she reported it, she did everything that she was supposed to, the school wasn't notified, and Quinn took no accountability for it, and he kept his job, no charges were ever filed against him because a witness coming forward probably terrified a 17-year-old girl in high school coming forward apparently isn't enough to even investigate. It's ridiculous. But either way, in 2014, the school also started seeing issues with Quinn as well. He was accused of sleeping on the job, using his cell phone while using cleaning equipment, which caused it to crash into a wall. He was accused of leaving the school in the middle of his shift. All of those things, though, he disputed. I don't know how he would dispute being on his phone while crashing into the wall. He might have just said that he lost control, but he wasn't on his phone. Not exactly sure. But he was also accused of stealing two iPods and an iPhone from the girls' locker room while the cross-country team was practicing. This was caught on surveillance video, so like the outside surveillance video of him entering the locker room and then leaving. He was the only one to enter and leave that locker room while the girls were doing track. 
Obviously, the locker room itself was not monitored, but once he was caught for this, I don't know exactly what happened, but it seemed like the girls that he stole from didn't want to press charges, so nothing happened. Then he was also accused of stealing another coworker's wallet, but once again, they didn't want to press charges. Then by 2016, a witness called 911 to report that they saw Quinn James choking a woman in the middle of an apartment complex parking lot in broad daylight. When police spoke with him, he denied the accusations, so for whatever reason, charges were never filed. So once again, clearly, Quinn had this history that if the school, or Muje, or I'm sure his fiance, if they knew about any of that, they wouldn't want to have anything to do with him. But again, he just fell through the cracks time and time again. So now let's go back to the summer of 2017 when Quinn was raping Muje over and over and over again. During that summer, DQ and Muje continued dating. According to Facebook messages that the two shared, Muje still really loved DQ even after everything that had happened to her. She called him her other half. She would constantly send him heart-filled emojis. She called him her other half, her protector, her shoulder to cry on. She said that he was her backbone. Now, this could have been a situation where he was protecting her. He said that he would protect her. And even though Quinn was doing this to her, she could have saw it like, well, he could be doing it more, but these other times he stopped him or something like that. Some sort of like trauma bond where she's been through a lot. He was there for it. So she just sort of saw him as this figure that could protect her even though clearly he was not. Apparently, DQ urged Muje to tell her mom about everything that was happening, but Muje was scared. Muje attended East Kentwood High School where Quinn worked, so he would often threaten her, telling her that he would change her grades in the system. He said that he would do whatever he could to ruin her academic standing at school if she had told anybody. She had seen him at school multiple times and others had even seen them interacting as well. So, she really thought that he had the power to really make things bad for her at school. But finally, by the fall of 2017, Muje wanted things to stop once and for all. She told her mom, Fatima, everything that happened. Of course, Muje's mother was broken. So she went to her sister or Muje's aunt, a different aunt than the one she was living with during that summer named Sano, and told her everything that happened. Together, the two called the school and sat down with her for a meeting with the school counselor, where again, Muje told them everything that happened. She told the school about the rapes. She gave very graphic detail, anything that she could tell them. She then went through a flip book of different photos and specifically identified Quinn James as the man who raped her repeatedly. Finally, after telling the school by November of 2017, James was taken in for questioning by the police. In that interview, he admitted that he had sex with Muje twice. Later, he would say it was a misunderstanding because he thought that the police was talking about a different young woman, but still, because of this initial confession, he was arrested on charges of rape. While in jail, he called his mother to talk about his charges. He told his mom that he ruined his life. He ruined everything. He said that he had sex with a girl who he thought was 18. He said after that, police just made everything up. Then, allegedly, he was speaking with another inmate in jail, and he told him that he was facing 25 years in jail. But he told the inmate that he was not going to let the girl testify against him. He apparently told the inmate that he wanted to get in touch with some guys that he knew in Detroit to see if they knew anybody who wouldn't let her get on the stand. Then, in another recorded phone call that he made now to his fiance, he said to her, quote, you know what's crazy that if she didn't show up, then the whole thing would be over if she doesn't show up. So clearly, Quinn is very outspoken about the fact that he wants the problem of Muje testifying against him to go away. Then it came time for Quinn's bail hearing. At the hearing, his fiance pleaded with the judge for a lower bail. She said that he has three kids to take care of. As I mentioned before, he had two twins who were around four years old from a previous relationship. 
He apparently had also taken in another four-year-old who had a developmental disability after another woman in the neighborhood gave the child up. His fiance said that, you know, he had a good job, he's on the right track, and that he needs to be out of jail so that he can take care of his kids. So, his bail was set to $100,000. He paid his 10%, which was $10,000, and he walked free. Once again, the courts didn't know about his violent criminal history. They just thought that he was someone who had stolen cars in the past and maybe slept with a teenager who he thought was 18. That was really it. That was the judge's reasoning for setting a bail in the first place, let alone such a low bail. Of course, after Quinn's bond was posted, Mujay was terrified and so was her family. They were afraid for Mujay's safety given that Quinn knew where she lived and knew where she went to school. His trial date also wasn't until April of 2018, months away, and the family was so worried about how far out that was. They were just terrified that something would happen in that short amount of time. So, on the morning of January 24th, 2018, at around 6.04 a.m., Mujay asked her mother for some money to go get some coffee before she left for school. But by the time school ended and Mujay was supposed to be back home, she did not show up. Hours passed and there was no sign of Mujay. So, the next evening on January 25th, her family reported her as a missing person to the Grand Rapids Police Department. Initially, as you can imagine, when police responded, they labeled Mujay as a runaway. They said initially that there was no signs of foul play, no signs or red flags that she could be the victim of an abduction, assault, or endangerment. Again, we all know the problem of missing black girls and boys being labeled as runaways, or really just any child or teenager from a lower socioeconomic area. They're always listed as runaways, and police just don't seem to care about them as much. But it's even more frustrating in this case as she literally just got done accusing an older man of raping her. He was literally about to go on trial for it. But police said at this time they didn't know about the sexual assault case, which again is just atrocious. I have no idea how they didn't know. It must have been in the system somewhere. I have no idea how that was missed, but they said that they didn't know. So again, clearly, like I've been saying, something with this system needs to change where there's a red flag that pops up that someone has been charged with sexual assault who is in relation to this woman that just went missing. Unfortunately, three days after Mujay was reported missing on January 28th, 2018, two students had been walking in a wooded area in Kalamazoo, Michigan, when one of the students noticed garbage all around on the ground. That made him curious, and he went deeper into the woods to look around. At first, the student thought that he saw a pile of clothes about 20 to 25 feet away from the path, but as they got closer, they saw braids sticking out, and at that point, they realized that they had discovered a body. When police arrived, they said that from the walking path, you wouldn't know that this was a body, but once you got closer, it was clear that this was the body of a young girl or woman. She was found wearing only one pink Nike shoe, and there was a blue plastic cap on her arm. Her jeans were pulled down to her knees, her underwear was jumbled around, and her coat looked like it had been pulled over her head. Investigators noted smelling a chlorine-based product near her body, and the clothing was streaky and discolored from what looked like bleach staining. They also found that her clothes were damp, so it was clear that someone had dumped her body there and poured bleach cleaner all over her body. Of course, the body was sent off to the medical examiner for an autopsy. The pathologist found that the girl's body was partially frozen due to the cold conditions at the time when her body was dumped, but they couldn't tell just how long her body was in those woods. They did determine that her cause of death was the result of asphyxia from strangulation, so she was murdered. They weren't able to identify the body just by looking at her or using fingerprints, so they used dental records to confirm that the body did belong to 16-year-old Mujay. Of course, the first and main suspect in the murder of Mujay was Quinn. 
but as they did their investigation, they wanted to make sure that Quinn wouldn't leave and that he would stay put. So they ended up charging him with sexual assault in relation to that 2014 case. His defense would say that this was clearly an attempt to arrest him and get him behind bars while they investigate. They said that police didn't care back then when she initially reported it, they don't care now. At the same time, investigators said that in light of this new information, they now think that they have enough to charge him with that sexual assault given that he was accused by another young woman. I personally think that it was to get him behind bars while they gathered enough evidence to get a conviction because they didn't want him to get away during that time, but I'm okay with that. So police started going around and questioning witnesses to gather more information. First, the bus driver that drove the bus that Muje rode to get to school came forward to say that on November 29th, 2017, after Quinn was let out on bail for rape, the bus driver noticed a car following behind the bus that looked to be following the bus. So it wasn't just like trailing the bus or like driving behind him pretty frequently. He noticed that it was following suspiciously. The driver noticed that the car would start following the bus immediately after Muje got on the bus. The driver noted the make, model, and license plate of the car because of how suspiciously it was driving, and it turned out that at that same time, Quinn had been using a loaner car from a dealership that matched the make, model, and license plate of that car, so clearly, Quinn was following Muje around from her bus stop to the school. Then, another witness came forward to tell investigators that in a conversation he had with Quinn, Quinn said, mother effer little bitch done accused me of rape, but he said that he never raped anybody in his life. Then another witness said that Quinn said to them that he hoped that Muje would go on vacation and that her plane would crash. Then yet another witness came forward to tell police that Quinn had asked him to help him find somebody who could take care of business with him. He said that a girl had been lying about him, saying that she was going to get him locked up, and he was adamant that the girl was lying to get him in trouble. He initially tried getting a gun from this person, but he ultimately decided that a gun was too loud. So, this friend ended up setting Quinn up with a man named Gerald Roach Bennett. Gerald was told that Quinn needed something taken care of, and he agreed to help. Cell phone data would later confirm that on January 21st, 2018, Quinn picked up Roach. By January 23rd, records confirmed that Roach received a $125 wire transfer from Quinn. By midnight on January 23rd, cell phone data placed both men near Mujay's apartment and near her bus stop. By January 24th, the cell phones were not showing any location data between the times of 7.40 a.m. and 9.09 a.m. Then after 9.09 a.m., Roach's cell phone was near the bus stop about an hour after Muje normally would have gotten on the bus. So that shows that they probably were around her bus stop. Possibly they did something to her during that time, turned their cell phones off so they wouldn't get caught to wherever they were going and dumping her body and then they returned and turned their cell phones back on. Then there was a witness who saw two men driving a black 2018 GMC Acadia near the woods near where Muje's body would later be found at 8.42 a.m. on January 24th, so that is when they were seen driving around. A camera near the trail where Muje's body was later found also showed the same car driving back and forth around the same area at the same time. The same car was seen driving to a car wash after that. Witness testimony and other documents confirmed that Quinn was in the possession of a 2018 GMC Acadia from the dates of January 19th to January 24th. After January 24th, after his cell phone confirmed that he was near Muje's bus stop and then by the woods and then at that car wash, after that, the car was dropped back off to the car dealership. Then, police took possession of the car and they discovered that Muje's DNA was in the backseat of that car. I believe the DNA was in the form of like trace blood evidence. Then police found more DNA evidence on Muje's body. A swab of the jeans that she was wearing showed that this DNA was at least 79 million times more likely to be a mixture of DNA from Quinn and another unknown individual. 
So it's saying that Quinn's DNA is on her jeans the same jeans that she was wearing when she went missing and when she was later found. Then on the dates between January 25th and January 28th, before news broke of Mujay's body being found, Quinn made multiple statements to multiple witnesses about this problem that he had being solved. He told one witness, it's done, and another, the situation has been worked out. Now, while he was in jail for these new rape charges, as, you know, police were investigating this murder case, the phone call to his fiance and others did not stop. In one call, he could basically be heard detailing the alibi that he wanted his fiance to tell the police. He told her to write down that he arrived to the middle school that he worked at at 7.15 a.m. on January 24th. Then he said to write down that he returned back home from the school where she was at 8.40 a.m. He even told her the roads and directions that he took to tell the police that he was nowhere near where she was abducted from or where her body would later be found. And so when police went to question Tiara about Quinn's whereabouts on the day of January 24th, she told them what Quinn told her to say, which again, obviously, was not true. So after finding out all of this information, hearing the jail phone calls, getting all of this evidence, Quinn was finally charged with Mujay's murder, but first they still had the rape charges to get through. So the trial for rape started in October of 2018. At the time, Mujay would have only been 15 years old at the time of the rapes, so she was not yet the age of consent. So even if it was argued that she did consent and willingly slept with him, which I do not think she did, it was still considered rape because of her age. At the trial, they talked about what Mujay had told the police before she was murdered. One of the witnesses who testified was, of course, DQ. It turned out that he was actually illiterate, I guess, and it seemed that he obviously did not have the best education and he was not the brightest bulb in the shed. He said that he helped Quinn plan to rape Mujay multiple times because he was afraid of Quinn. He described in detail what I told you earlier about how he watched what happened and held her hand while she cried and how he saw Quinn abusing his aunt and all of that. So that is why he helped with this and didn't stop him from raping his girlfriend. And you indicated Mujay wanted you to hold her hand. Yes. Did you hold her hand? Yes. I want you to describe what did Mujay's face look like when the defendant was having sex with her. Well, she was tearing up. Then, the prosecution talked about all of the witnesses who Quinn literally told that he slept with Mujay. There were several recorded jail phone calls where he admitted to his fiance and his mother that he had sex with her not knowing how old she was, so that wasn't in question. He did sleep with her. And just as like a side note, he literally worked at her school. She couldn't have been older than a sophomore or even a junior because she was 16, maybe 15. So I think she was probably a sophomore. No way he didn't know that she was under 18, but obviously he's making that up. It's just not a very good lie because we know that you worked at her school, dude. We know that you knew she was younger than 18. But either way, the defense had quite the interesting argument. They said that Quinn didn't rape Mujay, that it was consensual. They said that because Mujay was an immigrant from an underdeveloped country, that she was a refugee, it's possible that her birth certificate is wrong, that maybe the date and the year on her birth certificate are wrong, and that she is actually older than she is thought to be. Maybe she really was 18 like Quinn said he thought she was. Because again, some people argued that when she got to the US, they made her a new birth certificate that wasn't necessarily the same as the one that she would have gotten when she was actually born. Even though she was a sophomore in school, maybe the birth certificate was wrong and she was actually older than she told people she was. They also questioned about why Mujay would continue hanging out with DQ and Quinn after he raped her all of those times basically victim blaming. In my opinion, even if her birth certificate was wrong, again, he still knew that she was a probably, again, I don't know her exact grade, but he knew that she was in high school and he knew that she was not a senior, which is really the only way you can be 18 in high school unless you have like a really early birthday or you, you know, started school late, whatever. 
Most times, if you're a sophomore or junior in high school, you are not 18, and a lot of times you aren't even 17. So clearly, even if her birth certificate was wrong, he didn't ask to see her birth certificate. He didn't ask her what year she was born in to make sure she was, you know, of legal age. He did not care. He didn't care how old she was. He just wanted to rape her straight up. I also think that part of the reason that she continued hanging out with DQ again was because she was attached to him. She was a teenager. Teenagers don't know exactly what they're feeling. They think that they're in love. They think that this person is their entire world and even though bad things are happening to her, again, we saw that she saw DQ as her savior, as her protector, as her other half, as a shoulder to cry on. So clearly, something else was happening where she just felt attached to him. So let's not victim blame because, you know, I did question that too. I wondered why she was continuing to hang out with DQ, but based on the text messages, based on her age, we can tell that she clearly was just attached to him in some way for some reason. So let's not blame the 16-year-old girl who was raped, or I guess the 15-year-old girl who was raped at the time, because again, she was 15 at the time of the rape, 16 at the time of the murders. Let's not blame her. Let's blame the 43-year-old adult who raped her. Either way, at the end of the rape trial in December of 2018, the jury did find Quinn James guilty of third-degree criminal sexual misconduct. For this, he was sentenced to a minimum of 20 years in prison. Then, finally, in April of 2019, the trial for murder started. The prosecution argued that Quinn James kidnapped and killed Muje so that she could not testify against him at the upcoming rape trial. So, the prosecution said that Quinn hired 59-year-old Gerald Bennett to help him kidnap and murder Muje. They talked about the recorded jail phone calls between him and his mother and him and his fiance, where he talked about how his life is ruined and how she could testify against him and if only she wasn't there things would be solved. All of those witnesses who came forward about him saying that he has a problem that he has to take care of. Okay. And um, he explained to me that he was facing a mandatory 25 years and I told him that my last charge, I was facing the same thing. So we got into the conversation, then he explained that, you know, he can't go back and do 25 years. So he explained that he couldn't let her take the stand. So as the conversation went on, he was like, you know, he got to get rid of her. So he was like that he was going to go back to go to Saginaw when he got out to go to Saginaw to get the little guy, to, for the little guy to go talk to her, the girl, to his fiance's nephew. So as the conversation went on, he was explaining how he would do it. He explained that he would, he would get somebody from Detroit to do it, right? Because he, he, figured it, he figured it, I knew certain people. So he asked me a couple names, but I didn't really know who they was. It's just, he was just making conversation with me about it. But he was, to me, he was plotting to do it. The cell phone evidence, the surveillance video that showed him in the locations around her apartment and then in the wooded area where her body was found. They talked about the fact that small amounts of her blood was found in the backseat of Quinn's car and other DNA evidence that we discussed earlier. You can say that maybe something happened in the back of that car from the other rapes, I guess. You can say the DNA was from there and he's already in jail for the rapes and that shouldn't, you know, be considered murder evidence, but his DNA was literally on the jeans that she was wearing when she went missing, and if he claims that he didn't see her or talk to her that day, there you go. There's no other reason that her DNA should be on those jeans. If she was wearing them another time that she was with him, the DNA would have been washed off of them, so... He was clearly with her the day that she went missing. Then they talked about the numerous prior histories of rape and sexual violence. They talked about his history dating years back before Mujay's murder that just slipped through the cracks, how he's been a violent attempted rapist since the time that he was 15. Then they talked about the numerous other times that he raped Mujay before she finally was brave enough to report it. They also brought forward Mujay's counselor to take the stand to testify. The school counselor said that he was talking to Mujay after the rapes and after she reported him. According to the counselor, Mujay knew that reporting and testifying against him was the right thing to do, but she was scared. She was afraid for her safety and she was afraid of what he would do since he knew where she lived, 
he knew her bus stop, and even worked at her school. The defense, on the other hand, they said that Muje was actually having issues at home with her stepfather. They said that right before her disappearance, she was mad at her stepfather and made comments about wanting to run away. They said that the investigators just got tunnel vision and only focused on Quinn because police just wanted Quinn to fit their evidence rather than their evidence fitting to the most likely suspect. They said that after running away, Muje was murdered at random while she was on the streets rather than being specifically targeted by Quinn. But of course, they didn't have a lot to go off of. In my opinion, it was a huge reach and they really didn't have anything to back it up. He was the one who raped her. He was the one who didn't want the problem of her testifying against him. He was the one with the motive. Nobody else was. So it's pretty cut and dry. So, at the end of the trial, the jury spent four hours deliberating before coming back with their verdict. They found Quinn James guilty on three counts, including first-degree felony murder, first-degree premeditated murder, and conspiracy to commit first-degree murder. For this, he was sentenced to life in prison. Then, Tiara, Quinn's fiance, she too went to the court and faced charges for lying to the police, she was found guilty of this as well, and she was sentenced to five years of probation for lying and providing Quinn with a false alibi. Then, when it comes to Gerald Roach Bennett, his trial wouldn't be quite as fast as Quinn James. He was charged with conspiracy to commit murder and perjury. But in late 2020, after being examined by multiple psychiatrists, he went in front of the judge and was found incompetent to stand trial due to cognitive deficits, and because of this, he was released. My thoughts on this, obviously, if he is cognitively deficit enough that he can be convinced to help kidnap and murder somebody, why is he being released? Why isn't he being sent to an inpatient facility for mental health treatment? If he is so incompetent that he thinks that kidnapping and helping someone murder somebody else is a good idea, why is he on the streets? That makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. But by April of 2023, another psychiatrist found that Gerald may have actually been exaggerating and faking symptoms in order to make himself appear incompetent to stand trial. They went to a judge and argued that he did understand his charges and that he is fully capable of standing trial and facing charges. So, at this time, a judge did find him capable of standing trial, and as of right now, he is facing charges of kidnapping. He has not yet had his trial, obviously, but he could be facing as many as 20 years in prison if he is found guilty. As with any case that has these loose ends, I will keep you all updated on what happens with that as the trial for Roach Bennett begins. But that is where this case ends, and I'm sure, as so many of you are, this case just makes me so, so, so very angry. It's yet another case where a man is clearly violent. Clearly, he has no regard for women or life in general. I have no idea how these other charges were just swept under the rug and not even noticed by judges or other people who were involved in this entire case. Clearly, he should never have been allowed bail. We know that. The judge knows that. Everybody in this case knows that. The judge basically made the excuse that he didn't know about the prior convictions, that he was violent, all of that. And this is why we need to take victims of rape and sexual assault more seriously. The fact that all of those other times of violence and hatred towards women just fell through the cracks, it's unbelievable. It's so frustrating and it just shows that if somebody like this is not stopped, that things will just get worse and worse and worse until something like this happens. We need to stop letting these monsters slip through the cracks. We need to believe victims, and if there is any evidence, if there is a 17-year-old who walks in after seeing this man who she has no connection with, no prior history with, no vendetta against, like, no reason to just randomly accuse this random person of rape, we need to believe her because there's no reason for her to accuse this random person. I just don't understand. I think... At the very least, there needs to be investigations opened, and if there is, and if there's any evidence to show that it's possible that this happened, like maybe going to his house and seeing if there's evidence, maybe seeing if there's any of her blood anywhere, because when you're being raped, there might be blood somewhere. See if there's any witnesses who saw her, any witnesses who heard anything, anything at all, any witnesses who saw her 
you know, body language when she was with him in public. Literally anything that a police officer can do to investigate and figure out if this really happened. Because if it did, this person needs to be off the streets, clearly. And if it did happen, judges and other people in the criminal justice system need to be able to see this background when they are making decisions on bail. So I guess I could see if the judge saw this person that has no violent criminal history, you know, just has a couple slip-ups with stealing stuff and maybe he slept with somebody who was too young but he didn't realize it. Okay, maybe let that person out on bail, but if this person has any violence whatsoever against women and they are being accused of raping a woman or a young teenager, that needs to be taken very seriously and this person should not get as low as a bail as he did. And here we are now, he murdered this young girl who had so much to live for, so much potential in her life, and it was just taken from her. She did everything she was supposed to. She reported it. She was going to testify against him. She did everything that she was supposed to on her end and everybody else failed her. It's just tragic. It's absolutely terrifying when these cases happen like this. It's not just a lesson for us to be careful of who we spend our time around and who we trust in our lives, but it's a lesson for people in law enforcement and anybody in the criminal justice system that if these monsters are just let out there with a violent criminal past and it's clearly shown that they have no regard for human life or women in general, this person should not be on the streets. This person will retaliate against anybody who's going to get them in trouble. That should have been clear in this case and apparently it wasn't and a young girl, a teenager, lost her life because of it and it's just so, so very tragic. But as all of you know, I could go on a tangent about this for hours. I won't make you sit through that because I know you all feel the same exact way as me. I just hope that something can change. But that is where I'm going to end today's video and now I want to know what all of you think. Do you think that more could have been done to prevent this? Do you think he should have been let out on bail? Let me know this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to go ahead and check out my Facebook page, which will also be linked down below. Make sure you follow my Twitter and Instagram. Both will also be linked down below. If you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form that I have listed down below as well. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.